G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. We are loving the feedback we're getting, so keep that rolling in and your feedback and uh, the responses that we're getting enable us to get some awesome guests that come on. And today we are thrilled to be joined by Molly Benjamin from Ladies Finance Club. Welcome on, Molly. How are you doing? Yeah, great. Thanks for having me on the potty. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to say you're looking glowing because you have just spent a few weeks tanning yourself up. Uh, take us through, where have you been and, and what's, what's been on your um, on your holiday list recently? Yeah, so I was in the Philippines in Cebu for a conference and then I thought, hey, while I'm here, I may as well stay a little bit longer. So I ended up um, traveling a little bit of the Philippine islands and then yeah. heading over to Bali for a couple of weeks just to work from there and try out the digital nomad life, which suited me quite well. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, what I was saying before, like with your style of community and your work, it's suits it to an absolute T, but the Philippines islands, everyone says you've got to check it out because the photos just don't do it justice or the videos. What was your experience? And where's, the, I guess, your ideal spot? Yeah, so um, I did this, I mean, I went to a few different places, but definitely a standout was um, El Nido. And then you yeah. do like a boat trip down to Coron. And yeah, it was some of the most stunning scenery I've ever seen. And I've done a lot of travel. I've lived overseas for like a long time. And I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. So nice. apparently tourism in the Philippines with Australians is definitely increasing. So highly recommend you check it out. And it's so affordable as well. Yeah. We're being at, yeah. Affordable is one thing, an easy culture as well as another, where, you know, friendly oh, people, which is great. Yeah. yeah. Everyone speaks English. You yeah. feel so bad because literally everyone speaks English. And so I was trying to convince a few people I spoke Australian and English. <laughs> uh, nice. So take me through, I mean, you mentioned that you've lived overseas and you've traveled quite a fair bit. Um, and you, I know your journey kind of takes you back into comms. You've been in financial services. You've worked in London as well. So you've got quite an extensive resume. Kind of align that for us up a little bit and take us through like what was your background and, and what got you to this point as well in life? Yeah, absolutely. So um, my background's always, yeah, been working in financial services. So I was working um, for a bank in Australia and then I moved to London and I was working for a bank over there as well. But I was so bad with money. I had no idea what I was doing with it. I always call myself like a hot financial mess, but there was nothing hot about it. I was just a financial mess. And the thing was, I was earning like great money, uh, well, good money, um, and I had nothing to show for it. But I noticed as well, it wasn't just me, you know, a lot of my girlfriends were in very similar situations. And even the women I was working with at the banks, they were also um, in similar positions. No idea about retirement, no idea how to invest or really what it was, what a share was, what definitely had no idea what ETFs were. And absolutely like we just thought property wasn't even um, doable. So why, why bother? Um, so yeah, I actually ended up starting um my friend wanted to start a book club I said let's start a money club my um, dad had an investment club and they would meet once a month so I was like let's meet once a month and just like talk about money so we'd get a friend in who worked in finance and kind of that's where it all started but I just noticed so many of my friends were like oh my god are you going to do that money night again I really need to learn about money and I just kept hearing the same thing over and over. I'm so bad with money. I don't know where to start. Oh my God, I'm so embarrassed. Um, and so that's kind of where it started in my living room. Uh, what was it? Uh, two pizzas, two bottles of Prosecco, five friends. And now we've had around 50,000 women through our programs or have been to one of our online masterclasses, corporate workshops. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun journey and I've learned a lot on the way and learned a lot, you know, that being good with money is a lot to do with behavior mm. and um, discipline, actually not how much you earn or how smart you are. Excellent. I love what you've done there. Uh, a number of our guests, this is where they've kind of started, which was I'm sick of where I am, a bit of frustration and I'm going to make a move and people start to follow. So naturally you've kind of fallen into this leadership role, not kind of seeking it out. It's like, I need, I need to find the answer for myself. Therefore I'm going to go and people come on that journey. And then those people then attract the next cohort and the, the community starts to build accidentally, but yeah. someone needed to move first. Then you've done that. Yeah. And I think we just got there when like this whole movement movement was starting because it was back in 2018. And now, you know, it's so great to see so many more women in um, this area. I love it. I think, you know, we need all the women in this area that we can get being leaders and educating. Um, but I know when we first started, yeah, there was only a handful of us. 
you mentioned you're working in, in uh, financial services, as, as has been my background. Do you find it ironic that so many people work in financial services that have very, and I, I, it's not in a meaning to be offensive, but have very poor financial literacy themselves? Yes, but it also doesn't surprise me because it's the same as anyone working in kind of any industry unless you've been taught. You know, they don't teach you at work. You know, I was working in marketing communications. Mm. Like It's not like they're giving us financial literacy lessons. Um, likewise, you know, we have people in risk, compliance, insurance. Like they're not learning about how to invest their money. Um, and the fir very first event I ran in London, um, it was around 70% of the attendees all worked in financial services. Wow. And there was this real underlying, like, oh, I feel really embarrassed because I mm. work in financial services. I should know this stuff. And I'm like, well, why would you? If you didn't get taught at school, if your parents didn't teach you, you definitely didn't learn at work. Um, where would you? You have learned this and we've actually gone into banks i think we've been into like four banks now two in the uk um no three in australia and we've actually given financial literacy uh, master classes and you know would have people from admin to the cfo like it's kind of crazy <laughs> it is crazy it's crazy but it also says a lot when you go across corporate life as well people on some really good incomes so like you're saying at the end of it going Where's my money? Because I feel like I have nothing to show for it. And I won't say they're living flashy lifestyles and good incomes. Is it yeah. lifestyle creep? Is it there's just leakages in the money buckets? Like what are you seeing that you go, you have a good income, not much to show for it at the end of it? Yeah, it's look, we see it a lot. And again, I think people are very embarrassed because they're like, 100%. oh my God, how did I get here? Like I should have so much more. Everyone else is doing so much better than I am. But the thing is, we've never been taught about it. And I do love that analogy of like, you know how they say like the plumber has bad pipes and the, you know. <laughs> the mechanic never works on their own yeah. car and yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's the same with people working in finance. Like, um, and I speak to a lot of people in finance and, you know, they do not have their money shit together. Mm. Like I know when I was speaking to a woman working for a fintech, I said like, how are you with money? And she's like, oh, I'm a shocker. I spend everything. Me and my partner have no clue. And I was like, well, what's the goal? What are you saving for? Oh, nothing. And I'm like, well, that's the, that's, you know, part of the problem. There's no reason to save. I always say like, you know, imagine watching a game of football without goals. It would get boring really quickly. You know, you need two poles in the ground to make a goal. So I think that's a big one. People just don't have those goals. They haven't sat down. They haven't actually given it the thought and they just get caught up in the current of life. Oh, new phones out. Great. Oh, I want to go on a holiday to Europe here, but they're not actually going, okay, where do I actually what am I building towards? What am I wanting to achieve? There's so many women I speak to and I'm like, you could have had a property deposit oh, by now. You so could have true. been in the property ladder, but they just never thought it was possible. Um, and there's definitely the lifestyle creep. The more they earn, the more they spend. Um, but I think a huge factor is just education. We've just never learned. So we don't know how. And unless you kind of put yourself out there and you come to a ladies finance club session or you read a book, or you listen to a podcast, you know, you can kind of stay in your own world and never move forward. And the scary thing is now I think we're seeing women in their 40s and 50s who are either coming out of divorces or separations and they're in these really horrible financial decisions where if they just made a few different decisions earlier in their life, they would have so much more control over their life and lifestyle. Well said. Well said. There's, that's a topic that I definitely want to come back to in a minute. Um, the one that I had for you and I guess – I'm very uh, cautious of displaying my ignorance as a, as a man asking this question. So please <laughs> go easy on me. Um, but when you say like a ladies finance club, I'm looking at it going, what are the conversations or what are the challenges that are say unique to women or are they not? You just happen to create and foster a, a community that, that of, of women in finance. Yeah. Look, I think the biggest, um, like one of the biggest problems is we, get paid less for doing the same job as a man still. Mm. And then also a lot of the, um, I think it's like 95% of all occupations, men have higher average salaries than women. So, you know, for every dollar um, a man earns, a woman earns 78 cents. So there's still this pay gap. So we're getting paid less. Plus we live longer. So women live on average five years longer than guys. It's just how we're built. Um, and so we take those time, a lot of us take time out the workforce to raise families and 
Um, you know, the stat that just gets me is like women's earnings will fall by 55% in the first five years of motherhood where the fathers won't change at all. Mm -hmm. So that is the first problem. We're getting paid less and therefore we have less to um, invest with. We have less in our super. We have less that we're retiring on. Um, and then I think the other one, the other reason is like we're not socialized to talk about money. Um, women actually haven't had money. Like they haven't been able to control money for that long really it wasn't to the 70s that they could get a credit card in their own name and when you look at men they've been controlling the money the money's been in their name for generations generations they've been having these conversations you know I spoke to a lady the other day and she's like my dad told my brother how to invest and how to manage money I didn't get any of that information so again it seems to be this kind of very male topic that you know sometimes we just aren't socialized to talk about. Yeah. And and again, like I think we like to think that it's changing at Ladies Finance Club. We're definitely changing that conversation. But still, like, you know, we will talk about everything. We prefer to talk about own death than um, talk about money. Um, so, yeah, just spending that time. Uh, so, yeah, I'd say they're, they're the main ones. Well said. I did stress test that question by my wife, Bernadette. I was like, tell me, am I missing something here or uh, what's the what's the – um, what's the angle here? And it was that exact point where you said, this is something that's a relatively new challenge for women in this generation that they're, maybe their mums weren't working or their, you know, their grandmas hadn't worked and their mums would work part-time. And so there's no blueprint to follow around money yeah. management. So it's so new and it's a new challenge. And you now you look at younger women coming out more educated than younger men. So their incomes are starting to go up and they've never, they've never had that type of money before and how to manage it, how to control it. It's yep. a whole new challenge that they're encountering. It and once Buddy said that. Yeah. And, you know, the stats out there show that even if a woman is the higher bread winner, they're still doing more of the unpaid housework. Mm. And I think, you know, for, yeah, many of us were, you know, this generation, we're earning the most money women have ever earned. It's a really exciting time, yet we're not learning how to manage it. Mm. Yeah, and I guess there's almost a bit of a guilt uh, that comes with that, you know, that income. Uh, your wedge can I, and again I, I, I can only go by my experience with myself and Bernadette which is has an incredible gift at what her vocation is but feels torn to be you know a present and active mother as well and not outsourcing her parenting but also not outsourcing her work skills and it's uh, a rock and a hard place for young female professionals as well. Yeah I completely agree and I think it's just a really tricky situation and I, I don't know what the win-win is here. Mm. Um, I think it's, yeah, getting the partner more involved. But again, we need the systems to back that up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So take me through, what are, you, what are the common uh, questions that come up in your community? Say so when you do an event, what's the ones that, you know, particularly resonate? And then I guess yeah. inside the community, you've got some people that are really active and vocal and taking a lead. And what are the, what are the things that your community really want to be listening to as well? Yeah, so we actually survey our community um, quite often. So we did two surveys, um, one in January, one in May, and the same thing came out. So the thing that women want to learn the most who come to us anyway, and we had over, what did we have? We had over 1,200 people fill out this um, survey. Awesome. But it was very clearly they want to learn how to invest in the share market, followed by they want to learn how to buy property, whether it's their first property or an investment property. So those two things are really um, the key kind of uh, questions on everyone's mind. So how do I actually get started investing? What should I be investing in? What platform should I be investing in? How do I make my money grow? And I love that because, you know, we know women live longer. We, yeah. we earn less. We need our money to last longer. And investing is such a good way to achieve this. Um, and, you know, I always say like, to people come to a masterclass or come to one of our courses and that's going to give you so much knowledge and confidence that's going to stay with you for life and you know it's a really great starting point because it just should be part of adulting like mm -hmm. investing you brush your teeth you invest um yet so many of us don't know how or even kind of understand the basic concepts of it which is fine because we were never taught and their parents might not even been taught you know so it's this whole um generation thing as well yeah correct Buying shares versus buying property are two different beasts, really, right? And and yeah. there's I won't say there's different levels of involvement. It's still money, so the stakes get high as well. But do you feel that 
shares or ETFs can become a little bit more attainable, for example, versus property feels it's a bit more of a mountain to climb. What's been your yeah. experience with between the two asset classes? Well, definitely, you know, um, you know, you're spending what maybe like half a million dollars on this one asset yeah. when you're buying at, property. At the, it's very, a, it's the very it's least that we're getting sales. clients to invest at the moment, right? So yeah. yeah. And um, I work with this lady called Marion Mays and she always says, you know, it's not like buying a pair of jeans. You can't just take them back mm. um, if, you know, if the property doesn't fit. So, yeah, there's definitely um, different benefits. And we're obviously, uh, we speak with lots of different women who've got lots of different budgets. They might be working towards their deposits. So we talk about, you know, how investing is actually a great way to um, fast track your deposit if you've got a longer time frame. Um, but yeah, they both obviously have their benefits. Um, but, you know, I think the big thing at the moment is I think people are, you know, in the past, I've noticed like we talk about inflation, no one, not no one, but like a lot of the general, I would say, population didn't quite understand the concept of that or oh, prices are going up. Okay. And again, this is like some of the women that have come to us and they'll be like, oh, can you remind me again, what is inflation? So obviously not everyone, but um, definitely some women. And so I think now it's been in the media so um, so often, and we are seeing the direct impacts of inflation. So I think this is also driving people to actually, okay, I need to make my money grow. How can I do that? Okay, property or investing. And, you know, I love that I was on, um, I was speaking to ABC radio actually last night. And, you know, we're talking about wage, wages, like they're upping the minimal minimum wage to 3.75%, but inflation's at 3.6%. So really it's not doing much. So it's not growing. So we really need to be um, making sure that our money is working hard. Yeah. Yeah. This is it, isn't it? People are working very hard for their money. Their money's not working hard for them. And they're, you know, the barriers to entry, particularly around property, just keep, the goalposts just keep moving, isn't it? Becomes yeah. And you can invest with, you know, literally on some of these platforms, you can get started investing with a dollar or $50. It's mm -hmm. not like you need $10,000. And, you know, some people will say, oh, I'm feeling a bit nervous about investing all this money into the share market. And I'm like, start small, start with $500, you know, build it up. You don't have to go all in all hard straight away. Get mm -hmm. your confidence up. Make sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. Early before you said around, yeah, you know, women coming out of the workforce, I think you said that participation drops by 55% after kids. Was that your stat? Yeah. yeah, for five, uh, five years afterwards, yeah. Perfect. So let's go through a life cycle. I'm going to break this down for for women. I see this, uh, I mentioned to you, uh, I see this in our team and I see this with our clients as well. It just, it rings true. So you've got younger singles, maybe they you know, finish school, uni, for example, and in their 20s. So you've got singles, they move into, you know, dinks. So they're de facto, double income, no kids. Then they move into becoming young parents. And then you, you yeah. go into this uh, this time in life where, Maybe they do think about moving to part-time or contract work as well. And then you go into parenting, family life. Maybe there's a, a divorce separation on the cards at some point uh, for some relationships. And then it's a, a blended family afterwards as well. So that, yeah. you know, that has its own, um, yeah, its own yeah. uh, tricky parts to navigate. And then you move into this retirement phase. And so life is a, ter it's a, it's a long game, but when you break it down to these, I guess, these chapters in your life, there's some certain money milestones that really will happen from that earning, you know, that early stage of earning to that income tra trajectory as well. So yeah. breaking this down, there is a question in here coming, but I guess breaking that down, what are these key money milestones that you would see throughout these different phases in life? That if you can pick these up as good habits, they can carry you throughout life as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, young and single, if you can set yourself up with some really good, yeah, habits, like, and it, it might even be, you know, when you're at that age, it is about, you know, not spending everything. It's about saving a portion of your paycheck every month. It's about working out what are your goals. And it can be really hard to, you know, get young people motivated about, you know, saving for property or investing in the share market or putting extra into their retirement fund because it just seems not that important right then. And there's so much other stuff going on in their lives. Um, and I think then when we see that double income no kids or when they're moving into that family and kids section that's I think where we get quite a lot of women coming to us because they're kind of like all right I need to sort out my finances but it's taken them to that point like they might have just met someone or they might be thinking about okay um, I haven't met someone yet I need to actually do this by myself it seems to be that stage where people are actually going okay time to get switched on to my finances 
Um, the separation, the patterns, I guess we're seeing there as well is um, some of the women I've been speaking to recently who have been in this situation, they're coming out with not a lot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's some of them are getting inheritances and I'm like, thank God, thank God you're getting inheritances. Otherwise, you'd be part of that high growing demographic of people to experience homelessness, you know, that single women over the age of 55 or women over the age of 55. So, um, yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of them go, I wish I knew this stuff earlier. I wish I hadn't waited um, so late. And the International Women's Day, I spoke um, at events around the country. And at every event, I would have at least a few women come up to me and say, like, I wish I'd known about this earlier, about investing, um, and I wish I hadn't left it this late or I wish I'd taken a more active role in my finances. To which I say it's never too late. Absolutely. Like you've still got time. Um, absolutely. absolutely. But, you know, it is, you know, I find one of my jobs, the biggest job I have there is just trying to get people motivated to actually do it because then even when they're in that divorce or separation it's still very easy to keep your head in the sand because it just feels so overwhelming but you know there's always people there to help um, especially people who are in debt we've got fantastic um, services in Australia which are free debt counsellors um, and there's always help if you ask so um, yeah there's definitely some different patterns we see. That feeling of being stuck um, it's hard and I guess it's really hard for you and I because we and it sounds like you're very much like myself, we're enablers. We're like, look, yeah. and it's we're optimists and like, let's get in there, let's, let's, let's turn this around. But financially they can do it because we're looking at their scenario going, mate, we've, we've, we've done this in the past. But mm -hmm. mentally it, it takes a real shift to go from this feeling of being stuck to we can make this a reality. You can actually go and buy one, two, three investment properties and we can turn this into a portfolio. That's a real mindset shift for a lot of, and I'm going to say, for a bit older females because I yeah. don't know there, there's there's mental blockages and also this feeling of if it goes wrong I've risked everything and it's going to set me even further backwards and I think that's a bit that gets overlooked a lot it's actually the mindset piece the scarcity mindset versus the abundant mindset or the fact that you know they've been living in this scarcity mindset I'm so broke or mm. you know I'm being so frugal but actually they're in a great position they just haven't either realized it or they haven't allowed themselves to have to I guess really believe it and, and know what that means so I think a lot of the stuff we do at Ladies Finance Club it's the first chapter in my book as well it's like mindset okay what are your money beliefs and how do we reframe them if they need to be reframed but I would say most of the time they do need to be reframed it's very rare we'll get people coming along with really positive um, mindsets and again you know our money mindset is made up by time we're seven years old it's heavily influenced with how our parents behave with money um, so sometimes there's a bit of unpacking there to do and I had this uh, wonderful lady um, who I was coaching um, a couple of weeks ago and she'd had like half a mil in cash just sitting there and um, was spending $20 on self-care on herself. And I'm like, right, um, there's a bit of mind straight away. You go, okay, number one, probably need to speak to a financial account, um, financial advisor really soon. But also a money mindset coach as well, a money behavior expert, because there's definitely some big blockages going on here, especially when she said, I wish I didn't have it. It's just, it stresses me out so much. Wow. So there's always, um, yeah, it's actually amazing how often that comes up very early. Mm -hmm. Where does someone find, because I feel like they're, they're not niche, but you, you really go digging for someone like that, like a money mindset coach or a, um, like a mindset partner. Where does someone yeah. tap into a resource like that, Molly? Yeah, I mean, we have some great ones we work with and recommend. So we have, we actually ended up just listing them all out on our website, oh, awesome. um, like Ladies Finance Club slash ambassadors, because they are hard to find. And what we also love, the women we love to work with and refer to, they're um, financial advisors have turned money coaches. So they, or they might have done um, extra study in money psychology. So um, Karen Ely is one we work with and we just uh, created a course with her because we know it's not affordable for everyone to do one-on-one -on -one coaching. So we've created this online course where it literally will identify your money beliefs and then how to reframe them. Awesome. That's what a great resource. Well done. You just touched on something there 
where you go yeah. by seven years old, y- your money patterns or your money mindset has started to form. That freaks me out because I've got a five year old daughter. <laughs> and, when, yeah. and I think I've mentioned this in the past. We went past Smiggles the other day and she wanted to go in. I was like, look, buddy, have you got the money? And she's like, no, I'm like, well, we're not buying anything today. And then yeah. in front of everyone, she goes, I just wish we were rich, like so loud. And <laughs> if I could blush, I would have. Um, but take me through, like, how do I have that conversation? How do parents have this conversation? We go, look, we may have a good bank account, for example, or yeah, yeah we've got enough, and we're, we're comfortable, but we don't want to like be frivolous and just, you know, we want our kids to value money. Do we get them to work yeah. for it? How do we have these conversations that lift the frequency without it being that, that scarcity yeah. mindset? Well, I think the first thing is to actually have the conversation with your kids about money, about where money comes from, actually help them understand. Uh, because sometimes kids just think ATMs are magic wall, like magic money machines. Um, they don't understand how the money got um, got in there. So, um, you know, for I think many Aussie families, money was very hush hush. It was very taboo. It was bills were paid behind closed doors. Um, we didn't include the family in it. Um, so again, in my a chapter in my book, I run through a heap of different exercises um, that you can do with your kids but it's things like you know when you go to the grocery store um, you know get them looking and comparing prices work out what a goal is and how much money they need to save and when they get money you know do they get a little bit now that they can spend do they get a little bit that they have to um, give to a charity or do they have a little bit that they put towards a longer term goal so you can actually create some really great financial habits when they're quite young but I think the big thing is um, including them in the conversation. And I always have a go at my dad because, you know, classic Aussie dad, turn the lights off. But I never understood the reason behind it. And the reason behind it was he was going to work every day, working so hard for our family. And then he saw that as us just wasting the money. But what he failed to communicate was that backstory. So we just thought he had this weird thing with the lights. We didn't realise it was this whole underlying story. So I'm always like, you know, yeah, when you're paying, in, in, you know, encourage the kids to understand. And, you know, you might not be taking them through the dollar, dollar details, but actually, you know, it's a great opportunity to be like, this is the gas and electricity. And, you know, if you do want to keep the lights off, you know, make it a game, make it a challenge. Let's see if we can keep this down for the next one. And if that happens, what's the, what's the treat going to be? Yeah. Um, so there's a heap of different um, exercises in the book. I love it. I love it. Thank you very much. Uh, you also mentioned around older women, the risk of becoming homeless uh, you know, increases after the age of 50. It's a stat that blows my mind. You know, I've seen a lot of research around it as well. Um, I know we've done work with the Wollongong Homeless Hub as well, and they, they talk about this a lot. There's been, you know, there's been women that are professionals that are in their yeah. 50s that are having to sleep in their cars because of, yeah. I guess, the, the, the financial instability. So what yeah. has your research shown you? What do people need to know about? why this becomes such a high risk category as well. Yeah, look, it's so sad. And, you know, you get these women who've had careers who have had or they've given up their career to raise the next generation of Australians. They've done all the right things. They've done everything they've been told to do. And then they face uh, retirement in poverty or living out of their car or having to rely on their kids. And it just seems so unfair. But it's the way the system has been created. So, you know, it wasn't until I think it was like the early 90s that super came in. So, and if then they were, you know, looking after kids the whole time, there's a great chance that they don't have a huge amount of that. So I think, you know, the education piece is really important. Um, You know, saving emergency fund, working out what you can do now. So even um, if you're not working, like, it, it, you know, it might be limited, but there's government co-contributions, spousal contributions, um, uh, yeah, in, investing as well, maybe making additional contributions. Uh, so, you know, it is a really tricky one for these poor women who are now facing these poverty-stricken retirements. And, you know, you hear them speak and they just go, this is the last, I'm the last person I ever thought would be homeless, but a few bad circumstances um, and a separation. Uh, and that's the reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a sad, it's a sad reality when you think about it. But it's, yeah. you know, they've given up really a big unfair. part of their yeah, correct, big part of their identity raised raise their family, and then they're left with not much. And it's yeah, 
the only word I can think of is unfair. Yeah, it seems it seems so wrong yeah. that in this country this is happening. Absolutely. And so it definitely needs we need more like affordable housing options. We need more housing. It's just yeah, I I don't know what the solution there is for the current the current demographic facing this problem mm. apart from like the charity of others. Yeah, which yeah, that's not exactly the most reliable source to tap on, but no. um, yeah, great. Uh, you mentioned before around yeah, you know, there's a large tranche of like inheritance you know coming down the pipeline to to women uh, i think jb ware has this article as well um and that in that inherently has its own challenge like you're saying before that client that has five hundred thousand dollars in a bank account that's almost making them anxious to sit there and look at it that's that's what's going to happen to a lot of you know a lot of um well, i guess it'd be boomers wouldn't it um you know that would yeah, money yeah come boomers, gen x yeah, yeah. so to yeah. prepare for that and I guess no one wants to sit here and like wait for inheritance to come their way, but it's also like you've yeah. got to be prepared that if a windfall does come your way, what do you do with yeah. it? Because I guess preparation is key. Yeah, absolutely. Preparation is key. Educate yourself and um, <clears throat> know, speak to an accountant, work out how the tax is going to work. But, yeah, get get kind of clear on what it is you want to achieve with that money as well. Do you want to you know, retire early? Do you want to go on a holidays? What kind of holidays do you want? Do you need to pay off property? Like, what are your debts? So I think it's really important to sit down with an expert and actually go, what are my options? What am I wanting to do with this? And again, I think that lady, um, another lady in a, a similar situation where she did get an inheritance, um, you know, her, um, her thing was, okay, well, I can retire early and I can pay down debt. So they were kind of her two main goals from that money. So yeah, working out what are what are the next steps and then just educating yourself as well. Understand investing, understand the investing concepts, understand how that all works. And again, this is why, you know, we focus on like these different areas and we work with, we team up with different experts. So we have a get ready to retire program. And every time I sit in on that, I learn so much. I'm like, oh my God, like, we just aren't taught about this and you don't know what you don't know. So, yeah, education obviously is the, the big push there. Oh, absolutely. Well said. This is a question. I'm going to say it's, for a, view, it's a, a, a listener question. It also happens to be my wife, uh, Bernie. And this is, uh, I guess, Bernie's in a unique position where she works with, again, with a lot of female investors as well. And uh, when she's looking, I guess, on you know, pops the hood on their portfolio, one thing that really stands out is the disparity that happens between a male and a female's super balances, particularly, I mean, yeah. very close to our heart is having kids the last few years. You know, willingly, Bernie took some time out, but to the yeah. detriment of her super. Mm. And she's saying, look, you go through this bit of a desert phase where good, good earning years come out and my super balance just drops, has no ability to compound. Is there or could there be a solution where, you know, a partner, i.e. myself, can then do some contributions towards burning yeah. super, whether it's, you know, I don't know, some type of government co-contribution or there's some tax yeah. benefits attached to that as well. So a spouse that comes again out of the workforce to raise a family isn't penalised for that because yeah. that, that, that impact of compound just gets um, just gets lost. So again, I'm not asking you to solve this, I'm just asking you for perspective because um, yeah. this would be something that would come up again within your community. Yeah, well, I definitely think there needs to be a solution for this. Um, there is like, so as the government does the government co-contribution and then also uh, spousal contributions as well. But yeah, there's definitely, I think, a woman's wage if we actually converted that those non-paid caring roles. Um, so when they are staying at home and looking after the kids, it'd be the equivalent of $200,000. So, you know, I, I think it's... It's just so taken for granted. Yeah. Yeah. Undervalued, yeah. taken for granted. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I know there needs to be a solution. Maybe it is that partner giving them part of their super. So that can be compounding as well. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it, again, for me, it just feels like it's, it's very unfair. Mm. And we want women in Australia to be mothers. We want them to have families, but we don't support them through that. Mm. Uh, well said, well said. I can notice over your shoulder you've got, I love the title and uh, I love the cover. So you've done extremely well with your book, Girls Just Want to Have Funds uh, is your book that was released last year. Um, I'm not sure you can bring up a copy there, but um, I want to say well done on the book. It's obviously a journey that you go on to, uh, to pour some, some of your soul into your book. So for people that haven't picked it up, what can they expect? Um, 
when they when yeah. They so the I wanted to create a guide uh, for someone who knows nothing about finance isn't that into finance at all and would rather get a Brazilian wax and look at a budget so I wanted to create something for them that they could sit down with their girlfriends um, have a cocktail or have a coffee and work through it chapter by chapter and it would not send them to snoozeville so I'd like to think I've achieved that um, I think there's only 300 copies left um, in Australia which wow. is great from the mass print they did um, and so it literally takes you through everything from mindset through to budgeting, super, property, investing. Um, but it's very much like a how-to guide. So I think like the first line is like, you can name the Kardashians, but not how much you spent last week. That's okay. <laughs> I'm going to get you there. So it's quite it's quite fun. But if you work through it with your friends, you'll be feeling, I'd like to say, very financially confident afterwards. Well said. Well said. Uh, that's the female version. I, I ask guys, I'm like, what was the score in the footy the other day? And they're like, they can tell me this, what do you earn per year? They don't know. And I'm like, right, we need to change this up. You need to know your numbers, not your sports team's numbers. Perhaps they can, you know, they can quote numbers from yesteryear on grand finals. Yeah, but when it comes so to true. what's your rate, what's your savings budget? There's like, it's eyes glaze over. So yeah, I think when you talk about financial literacy and owning that yourself, putting that high yeah. on the agenda, it's not that you, and I think some people feel that it's my ability that I've got to love money and I've got to be really into it, for example. It's not it's not that shameless or that love of money. It's going, if you're not good with your money, someone else will be. If you're not in control, someone else will control that for you. And if you really kind of want to grab the bull by the horns for this, then you've got to take control, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. If you can't manage $1,000, you can't manage $10,000, you can't manage $100,000. Mm. So, yeah, it's 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 important to actually... Get familiar with these and it doesn't take that long. I always say to people, it's actually not going to take that long. You just got to get over the mental block. <laughs> yeah. That first, yeah. Take that first step, baby steps mm -hmm. after it's going to get a little bit incremental. It's going to get, once you get into a habit, it's going to start to becoming like where you, where you actually want to sort your finances out. You want to get ahead of the curve. And then once you're mentally ahead of the curve, then you can start to be proactive investing here. For example, you know where your money's going. You don't have that level of yeah. being frivolous as well. So Molly, I want to say thank you very much. What we're going to try and do is get one copy of that book, uh, whether we can order it or we're going to give away for yourself. We're going to give one copy away because I think it's such a great resource. I had a look through it as well. So um, to a listener or a viewer, uh, I'm going to make it fast as fingers first. Whoever drops us a DM saying, give me a copy of that book, uh, we'll send one on your way and let us know what you got out of this episode and we'll make that book yours. Molly, I want to say thank you very much. So for people that want to jump in, learn more about the community, learn more about yourself and what you're doing, What's the best way to get in touch with yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So head over to ladiesfinanceclub.com or give us a follow on Instagram. We do a heap of free workshops, free masterclasses, and then we have a heap of um kind of paid uh, programs, live programs where you can join us each week. So yeah, check it out. Awesome. Thank you very much. We wish, we wish you all the very best on your mission, uh, empowering women to take control financially is not something that uh, that you do lightly. So kudos to you and your, uh, and your team and onwards and upwards, my friend. Great. Thanks so much. That's all right. That's wrapping for another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I know we talk about property, but I think when we talk about women, we talk about, you know, getting into property as well. I think it's a big cohort of investors that sometimes gets overlooked. So if this has helped you on your journey, mission accomplished. That's a wrap and we'll talk to you next time. Mm -hmm.